Ephesians chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, ESV, and it reads, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed, which is the title of today's message, blessed, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Let us pray. Father God, I come to you as humble as I know how, asking you, O oh God, just to help me to be able to present your word in a way that is pleasing to your heart. O oh God, let it be all of you, all of your word with no mixture, sound in your word. Let it be complete. Let it be whole. Let it be full of grace. Let it nourish the mind, nourish the heart, nourish the spirit. Let it feed us, O oh God, and build us up in a way that we can live our everyday life in you, in Christ. These things I pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now here we have Paul writing to the church of Ephesus. And this letter, as some, some of you may all know, is one of four epistles that Paul wrote from prison. Philippians, Colossians, and the personal letter to Philemon are the other three. And this letter in particular, which is one of the overall 13 letters that Paul wrote, in comparison to the other 12, it has the shortest greeting or salutation that was written to the believers. And we are not given a reason why. Um, we can only speculate and form our various opinions. And some might even say that it's not even relevant. Why bother? There's nothing important about it. But I beg to differ. Because what if it is relevant? What if it is important? I mean, we are seeing this in the Bible, the word of God. Now, mind you, Paul is in prison. We know that for certain. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1 tells us that. So what what if the shortened salutation in this particular in this particular letter is is indicative of Paul's current state of mind in prison? Therefore, could he be providing us a a hint of what sort of emotional and or mental mood that he is in in Christ in prison? And thereby, he is setting the tone for the overall temperament of the epistle. Because for me, I can't speak for anyone else, but for me, when I read the book of Ephesians with this shortened salutation, I am led in thought that Paul is feeling in the, in the moment just as free as a, as a bird. He is down, but, mo but by far, he is most certainly not out. And I like to believe that there's this great enthusiasm here that resulted in this shorter version of greeting the people of God here in this letter. I personally think that Paul is feeling pretty good and ready to hop into it and give the Ephesian an encouraging word, an encouraging word from God. Especially when we consider the sort of relationship that Paul had with these believers here in Ephesus. Because according to scripture, it is said that he spent much time with them, three years, around 54 to 57 AD. And before this letter, Paul met up with the Ephesian elders in Miletus. We can read about that in Acts chapter 20, verses 35 through 38. Let's do it. I'm reading from the ESV. These are the words of Paul. It says, in all things, I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed 
to give than to receive. And when he said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. And there was much weeping on the part of all. They embraced Paul and kissed him, being sorrowful most of all because of the word he had spoken, that they would not see his face again. And they accompanied him to the ship. So there is a there is a deep relationship here with Paul and the Ephesian church. So with that being said, Paul, who is usually known for being very passionate, very fervent consent concerning the things of God. I believe that this unquestionable zeal in a more special way spilled over into this letter. And he just wanted to just in excitement, just jump right into it and shorten the salutation. And in doing so, he is giving us what the Lord is saying, as well as giving us a reality of the word in himself, because you get this sense of freedom, just, just vibrating from these words. And this isn't a put on whom the Lord set free is free. Indeed, you can't fake freedom. So Paul is giving us a glimpse of what freedom looks like in spite of his chains, irrespective of his imprisonment, all behind a prison pen being moved by the superimposed hand of God that we may all that we all may be blessed by these words that's about to be said. Therefore, he, he cuts to the chase and he is providing the same comfort that he himself is being comforted with by the same Holy Spirit that is at work in all of the saints around the world under pressure. This is the way we ought to conduct ourselves under pressure. In spite of our trials, in spite of our difficulties. So it's like Paul just springboarded off of this intentional short salutation in order to quickly dive into this heavy God honoring exhortation that immediate ensued, immediately ensued. And of course, Paul expectation is to provide immediate encouragement to the people of God here in Ephesus as well as all who read this letter in this present hour. Does that make any sense to you? So I love what's happening here because I'm quite sure that many of us can say that there are some of those times in life that we are like, hurry up, mercy. <laughs> Come on, joy. What's taking you so long? Peace, quick dragging your feet. Mercy, joy, peace. Y'all could just, we could say, y'all could just shorten up or even altogether skip the greeting, the salutation, no need for introduction, just come on with it. Because sometimes in life, there's that, that urgency, that urgent need of a word of encouragement like yesterday now. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there like, like needing that immediate comfort, like Lord, hasten this way, some comforting relief and tell me, tell me that everything is going to be okay. Like when you lose a loved one. Like, Lord, tell me these, tell me some things more clearly. Let me see it more clearly in your word that I may know that your word has revived me. The dead relationship that I, that I have with my own family, Lord, revive. That lost friendship, oh God, financial, health, medical, mental, this dead marriage, this dead feeling that I have on the inside of me, oh God, resuscitate, revive me. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Because evidently, you can. Because the psalmist says, this is my comfort in my misery that your word has revived me. Psalm 119 verse 50. I guess we just need to believe. Have faith. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So I guess we need to look forward and appreciate those feet. Because Romans 10, 15 says, how will they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good 
news of good things about a good God because the Lord is good and he's always faithful towards his saints who are faithful in his son, Christ Jesus. Paul says God is faithful by whom you were called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. First Corinthians chapter one, verse nine. He is always faithful. Will you trust him? You know, when I was writing and got to this portion of the message, I had to stop and go and do a few x-rays. Yeah, I, do, I write a lot of God's sermons at work in between patients. And little did I know that the pause was all according to God's plan. Because the next part of this message was actually going to be provided by a patient, a fellow believer. So here I am doing the x-ray examination. Because he came to us uh, for a follow-up visit three, late, three weeks later after being involved in a horrible accident six days before Christmas 2023. Hospitalized for three days. It was a motor vehicle accident in which both vehicles involved were, were going 70 plus miles per hour with no skid marks revealed at the scene. Meaning no one hit the brakes. According to the police report. So evidently, neither one saw the other or when they did, it was too late. This was a man that I once prayed with. Him and I had a random, um, spontaneous prayer meeting in the middle of a store parking lot one day. Yes, this believer in God told me that after the accident that when he woke up, he came to realize that, that his clothes were being cut off of his body. You know, in, in order to provide him with some medical treatment. They did that after they pulled him out of the back window of his vehicle because the front end was smashed to pieces. And after regaining consciousness, it is then when he overheard some people talking to one another in agreement, saying, yeah, two people are deceased. And he was like, what? Where is my? Because sad to say, one of them was his own son who was the driver of their vehicle. You see, it was father and son returning home from a hunting trip. Again, this is what I'm talking about. Here's that urgent need of a word of encouragement. That moment like, give me an Ephesian letter. Like a shortened salutation because I need some immediate comfort. Like, Lord, right now, hasten me some comfort like yesterday now. Tell me that everything is going to be okay. Now, to be honest, to be honest, I did not have any words to say other than I am so sorry. And we can all say that while gently wrapping my arms around him on two separate occasions in my feeble <laughs> efforts to comfort him because I didn't have much of anything to say. Loud mouth, talking of Otto, was speechless. But the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the helper, oh yes, the helper, the, the Holy Spirit had plenty of things to say. And these are the words that this man of God spoke to me in the doorway of the exam room, you know, before we both went our separate ways. He, he began things by first saying these three words. The good Lord. Ah, is that not a word all by itself? Hey, remember those feet I told you about that we need to appreciate? Romans 10 verse 15, here they are. Listen to this man preach. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing. He said, the good Lord. Is that not in scripture? The Lord is good. I believe you can see that in Psalm 34 verse 8. Nehemiah 9 verse 20, Psalm 100 verse 5, Exodus 34 verse 6, Psalm 143 verse 10, Ezra chapter 3 verse 11, Psalm 145 verse 9, Mark chapter 10 verse 18, James chapter 1 verse 17, the Lord is good, the good Lord. The Lord is good, a stronghold in a day of trouble, and he knows those who trust in him. 
he went on to say, the good Lord took. What does the Bible say in Job chapter 1, verse 21? Let's read. ESV. It says, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin or charge God with wrong. He charged God with no wrong. Do you hear me? The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. He said the good Lord took. Uh, he won up Job. He said the good Lord, he put an adjective on it. Some emphasis on the God that we serve. Not just the Lord, but the good Lord took my son home. Now you would have thought that he would have stopped right there. Because the good Lord has been honored. The good Lord, the blessed one has been magnified. But no. Mm -mm. He didn't stop there because with tears in his eyes, he went on to say, Romans 8, 28, you know, all things work together for the good. Oh, yes, he said that for those who love the Lord. He told me, you know, when when the Lord says all things, he means just that all things, the good things and the bad things. He said all means all. That's the resemblance of a true child of God who is faithful in Christ Jesus. He ended the conversation with that familiar scripture that we all know that ends with that, with those two words, his purpose, God's purpose, which, by the way, is always in Christ Jesus. You see, it's one thing to quote the word of God. Ah, but it's a totally different animal to live the word of God. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. This is the mark of a true believer, the mark of a true saint. Yes, he is to be counted as well as all of us, along with the people of God, who Paul refers to in verse one as saints that are faithful in Christ Jesus. Yes, let's get back to the text. And continue to move through slowly. And no, 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 no. Our, our ears are not deceiving us. We are hearing Paul correctly right here. He referred to the Ephesians as saints. We are all, all of God's people. God calls all of us saints. And yeah, I know. When we look around at each other, that's a pretty hard pill to swallow, isn't it? Let alone digest that absoluteness of truth, but it's true. Let us not pay attention to what we see in the mirror. Because to be honest, to be honest, if we wrestle with that truth, then we are also picking a fight with grace that we are saved by through faith. That Paul says in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that is not of our own doing. You can't save yourself. It is a gift from God not a result of works. Come on now. Come on. Do you actually think that what that man said after losing his son, that sort of strength, do you think that came from himself? No, that's a gift from God. You can't work that up on your own. You want to know whether or not you are a child of God? A trial will show you whether or not you are a child of God. And I assure you, you won't walk away beating your chest. No, in humility, you will come out saying it is most certainly a gift from God, not a result of works. So that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And by the way, this phrase in Christ or the equivalent to is mentioned 27 times in this one letter to the Ephesians. My guess is because we need to be in Christ. My guess is because our victory is found only in Christ Jesus. Yes. 
in Christ Jesus for good works that we may have to walk in, even in tragedy. Good works that we may have to walk through, through the valley of the shadow of death in Christ. In Christ who is life. Because just like in Matthew 22, 31 through 32, regarding the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Yes. As tragic, as unfortunate as it may be. I give God your Lazaruses. And you better believe it's difficult. Because straight is the gate. Narrow is the way. Is that not in our Bibles? That's why. That's why the status of the saint. Must rest upon the status of God's grace. Because the Bible says that those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say about these things? If God is for us, who who can be against us? Who can be against us? When everything about us is a perfect work done solely by the righteous hand of God in Christ Jesus. That's why. That's why Paul says in this shortened springboard salutation to the saints who are in Ephesus, who are faithful in Christ Jesus, and he is speaking to us too. In verse two, he says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. That concludes the greeting, the salutation, which is verse one and verse two. Then Paul dives right into it in verse three. Again, here is a wealth of, of encouragement straight out of the gate. Verse 3, ESV. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. My goodness. My goodness. How can this man talk about blessings while being locked up in prison? That's like a poor person talking like he's rich when he doesn't know where his next meal is coming from. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Let's let's unpack this. Let's unpack this. Y'all ready? Backing up and starting with the very first word in this verse. Verse three, Paul says, blessed. 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 Nowadays, how often do we hear that word? Blessed, even among the unbelieving secular world, where it seems like they are trying to strip that term of all of its sacredness and secularize it, especially when you hear it coming out of some of the most vile conversations in farewell, farewell departure. Be blessed. Be blessed, really? Be blessed in what? In who? God? Really? That conversation didn't have nothing to do with God. And what about within the Christian circles where it belongs? Yeah, what about it? We rarely say God bless you. When we bid each other God speed, uh, when we depart from one another, and maybe it's guilt. Maybe it's easier to say be blessed rather than God bless you because some of our behavior, some of our conversations that are supposed to be in Christ is more like of the world. So so let's just cut it short. Drop God off to hide our shame, yet at the same time try to keep keep our Christian Christianity intact, that facade that we have and try to keep that intact. So let's just say be blessed. 
Because that can mean anything. That can mean be blessed in God or be blessed in something else. So I'm covered. Oh, by the grace of God, let us all learn or relearn this truth and teach or reteach this truth. Because we have to untwist this term and put it back in the most proper, in the most sufficient, dominant place where we will be blessed when we know that all blessedness belongs to God. To God. For the Son of God, Jesus, remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? Mark 14, 61. This word blessed, blessed with the two syllable usage is translated from the original Greek word eulagetas, which means just that, blessed. It means praised. This term basically means quote unquote to speak well of. And in God's case, reverently. So we, what we have here is the unmeasurable, holy, holy, holy to the utmost spoken well of one, the praised one, the blessed one. He's blessed. As we can see to start things off in verse three, because this word is first being used in the form of an adjective. So it's no different than saying the great God, the wonderful God, the marvelous God, the blessed God. Here, here in the book of Ephesians, here in verse three of chapter one, Paul said, blessed, you like a be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. Who has blessed us. Now here is the verb use of that word in one syllable use. Blessed, eulagio, which means to praise. Celebrate with praises, to invoke blessings. This is activity. The verb is all action now. So the blessed one that is, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, did so in a way that there would be no shortage of blessings. Because he gave us the source of all spiritual blessings found only in the Son, Christ Jesus. Yes, he's the storehouse of all blessings. He's the mediator. For there is only one God one blessed God. First Timothy 2, 5 and 6, it says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. The testimony given at the proper time. So again, the blessed one, God, the true living God, blesses us. He celebrates us who are in Christ that we may celebrate him, the Christ who died for us, that we may render back to him, God, all the praise, all the adoration. You like, yo, we bless God, a Psalm of David. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Therefore, we are only given back. As a matter of fact, we are privileged to only give back to the blessed God what is rightfully his. What he rightfully deserves, and that is blessings in Christ. Praises in Christ, who is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. Hebrews 1, 3. Verse 3, here in Ephesians, it says, chapter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Blessing. 
spiritual blessings. Blessings. Here we have the noun form of that word with the ing suffix. Translated from the Greek word eulagia, which means praise. This word means laudacious, panegyric of Christ or God. These two terms, these two words, laudacious and panegyric, are for the most part synonymous. And some synonyms of these words are acclamation, acclaim, award, prize, tribute, accolade. These terms can relate to the sort of blessings we will receive from God. Yes, we bless him in Christ Jesus in a everyday style of life, reflected in our behavior, reflected in our conversation. And all of these terms can be distributed and diversely detailed in so many different ways based upon the Holy Spirit's decision and purpose of the spiritual blessings that we receive. But I have to say, out of all those terms mentioned, it has to be that last one on the list that I saw that grabbed my attention. I say to myself, that's the one. That's the best one that provides the widest range of support on how we ought to, to relate to all of our spiritual blessings received from God in Christ. And that last word that was on the list was approval. Yes approval. May all of our received spiritual blessings stir up in us a way that the blessings that we receive isn't recognized as true blessings if they do not move us, do not move our day-to-day -day lives and step with God's approval. His approval, it says in Colossians 4, 6, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. James says in chapter 1, verse 12, blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. That's what we want, the crown of life. That should be our aim. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So we need to be able to say that when things are good, I'm good. I'm in Christ. I'm blessed. Just as, just as blessed, as when things are not so good or even bad. Oh, I'm still good. I'm still in like manner in Christ. I am still blessed. Be blessed.